Hello and welcome to another episode of the CG Garage. This is episode number 301 featuring Mike Campo, who is a fantastic digital artist and does incredible work. Uh, I loved this podcast. It was so, so, so interesting. You may not actually know who Mike Campo is, but you've definitely probably seen his work everywhere. He is, does a lot of advertising still work uh, that's in, uh, you know, uh, advertises and uh, magazines and on the web all over the place really really incredible stuff uh, he's a big user of moto as well and v-ray for moto so that was also interesting to hear a little bit about that but i uh just thought it was really cool kristen what did you think of uh of mike yeah i loved it um i call it mcdonald's for the win when he was like three years old he won the uh, drawing contest there and then it was kind of skyrocketed from that um and he's just like yeah. you said before produced imagery for like Under Armour, Chevy, and amazing uh, character portraits of some big celebs. So, um, and another yeah. thing that I <laughs> thought he uh, did a good point on was he's very much into being like your own artist and following tutorial, following tutorials helps, but do your own thing um, and just be you yes. and, and have your own style. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it was really, really cool. And then on top of that, having your own style, the other thing that I really liked that he talked about is the importance of doing uh, uh, passion projects or personal projects and how to really take advantage of that, how to make it mean something rather than just giving an expression out. You actually put meaning behind it and it motivates your customers or your clients to come back to you for wanting to do something of that nature. And it really sort of is... Uh, just listen to the podcast. It's really yeah. good. It's a really r the right way to think about it. So I was really happy to have him on. Okay, we've got some announcements, Kristen. What are they? Re real quick. All right. So we have four events coming up and you can find these out at chaosgroup.com slash events. First one is the illumination challenge. You have until November 30th to fill the, uh, sign up for that. And then uh, November 17th through 18th, we have a V-Ray Fiverr SketchUp Masterclass. And then November 19th through 20th, um, it's Elm Tech V-Ray Fiverr SketchUp Masterclass. So we'll have Elm Tech, Arcalime, and uh, Chaos Group members uh, come speak there. And then November 24th, it's the webinar, and that's V-Ray 5 for 3DS Max in Russian. So a lot of good things. Perfect. That's great. So yeah, lots of good things. And again, these are all uh, online events. So you guys can check them out and do them from home. Uh, and they're all available at chaosgroup.com slash events. We also have several product announcements that are very big. Obviously, we announced last week that V-Ray 5 for SketchUp is out, which is great. Lots and lots and lots of great new features for our SketchUp people there, new frame buffer, including also V-Ray Vision. I think that's the first time that you guys are going to be seeing V-Ray Vision. Uh, and I'd really be curious to see what your feedback is on V-Ray Vision because I think it is very, very interesting uh, in terms of our real-time ideas uh, and what that means. Uh, we also have a V-Ray Benchmark. We've updated V-Ray Benchmark now, V-Ray Bench, V-Ray 5 Benchmark or Benchmark V-Ray 5. I forgot the name of it exactly. But it's out and I've been using it for uh, uh, quite a bit to test it out, make sure it's all working. We now do three tests. We do a CPU test, a CUDA test, and an RTX text test. Uh, you have better filtering, better searches. Uh, it's it's actually uh, quite quite cool. So do, definitely check it out. I've been uh, lucky enough to test it on some pretty kick-ass hardware. So it's kind of fun to, to play around with it. So uh, let us know what you think and go ahead and put your scores up. See how much you bench, as uh, Lon likes to say. <laughs> All right, cool. Now, in terms of the podcast, Kristen, where can where can people find out more about the podcast? You can go to facebook.com slash CG Garage podcast or chaosgroup.com slash CG Garage. Perfect. And also, uh, you should note that uh, uh, the, the podcast is also in video form, so you can check us out in video. Uh, sometimes the videos don't work all the time, so you may just have, you know, it's just mostly audio, but you want to check out the video go check it out we're on uh, we're on youtube we're on our on our facebook page as well but on youtube it's just chaos group tv we just put them all up there as well uh, we're trying this new thing now with riverside and i'm actually pretty happy with it so i think our video technical issues are going to go away finally but uh, we still have quite a few podcasts that are in the backlog that, <laughs> <laughs> that we're going to get through before we do that anyway that being said please enjoy this awesome podcast with mr mike campo Welcome to another CG Garage, where the chaos group talks. You'll know it's over when the last bucket drops. We're gonna fire off rays in high dynamic range. We know that ambient occlusion is passe. Global illumination won't lead you astray. 
And while image-based lighting is really swell, you need to make sure everything has for now. For sure. Well, thank you so much, Mike, for for, for doing this. This has been uh, really cool. I know that uh, you've known, uh, or David uh, Tracy recommended we have you on, which is a really great idea because I know your work has been really amazing. And it's a kind of area that I think people would love to know a little bit more about how people got into it and how the, that happened. So in order to figure out that that origin story, where where like what got you interested in art? I mean, what got you interested in, in photography? I'm sure you have a big photography background as well, right? Right. Yeah. So actually it didn't it didn't start as photography. It started as, you know, as a kid illustration. I was a three year old won a McDonald's drawing contest and that's when the whole career you started. Want a you did, really? Yeah. A McDonald's yeah. drawing contest. Explain yeah. that. How did how did that start? That, it was just, you know, back in the day they used to have those parties at McDonald's, you know, and they'd give you a sheet of paper and you could draw a character and I drew Grimace. Uh -huh. Um and they put them up in the wall and then people voted on them as they went through and I got a call and they're like, hey, you won the whatever McDonald's Christ. <laughs> you know, you got a happy meal and a tour of the back Room. it was it was amazing yeah. <laughs> <laughs> i remember as a three-year-old i still remember it it was the tour was very short but you know as a three-year-old it was it was pretty amazing so okay that's, I guess that's, how, that's, that's my origin story i guess it's that's awesome one, but, yeah. um but so you know i went to school i, I always knew i was going to get into art you know through high school going into college and I actually started um scientific illustration got kind of bored there's no creativity in it obviously you can't you know drawing surgical procedures you can't put extra hearts or things in there <laughs> that you want to creatively right so i got kind of bored and i'm like i just can't do this the rest of my life sure switched over to do graphic design program kind of liked it you know but didn't love it and i just kept finding myself going to the computer lab like all the time doing photoshop when it first came well actually it was called barney scan the very first um you know, see of uh, Photoshop was Barney scan and then Photoshop. Okay. Know. So I started with that and that's kind of what got me into just computer, you know, imaging and graphics. And then out of college, uh, got a job in a retouching studio for automotive, which was attached to a photo studio. So it was right. like a, like a 60,000 square foot with a huge eggshell psych wall photography. We would Is this shoot. in Michigan, I'm assuming. In right? Michigan, yep, in right. the Detroit area. So, you know, we would shoot vehicles in studio, yeah. output to film, scan film in, do all digital retouching, output back to film. Right. Um, so that's kind of where I got the professional experience and sort sure. of saw the ins and out of the advertising agency through the automotive. And then but I was in more of a design studio. So that, you know, I was doing all kinds of stuff like logos and corporate identity and, you know, just a bunch of stuff. And then over the years, I just, I picked up the photography um, aspect of it and really loved that. And then while I was in school, I used to do some CGI, just dabbled in it a little bit, didn't know much about it. Mm -hmm. and that was back in the day of like Forum Z and Strata Studio. I don't know if you remember those like oh, yeah. old programs. <laughs> um, On a Mac, so right? Yeah yeah. yeah yeah so we uh you know that was kind of my first taste early mid 90s you know and then i fast forward and then i started getting into the retouching and we were trying to find solutions to do it in the computer and then we started doing computer graphics with some alias and autodesk and some other software and then you know probably about 10 years ago i said you know this is what i love to do it's just the cgi photography combination like i I'm just going to like bite the bullet, go out on my own and just do that. Cause every time I was doing something else, I was hating it and wanted to do, you know, CGI and photography and still imagery. So huh. that's kind of where, you know, the journey took me and then, you know, to where I'm at today. So I've been on my own now for going on eight years officially. Um, you know, okay. I used to freelance way before that, but you know, right. on my own, on my own for almost eight years now. Right. But yeah. that's interesting. You came from like one of the first things you were doing was car stuff. Like car, car, car photography is hard. <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's very hard, uh, especially, yeah. you know, because it's all about, I mean, I used to actually did, did CG cars for a long time and yeah. I learned the hard way about how to get that reflection perfect on the hood of the car right. and getting all of the door handles right. And 
the spokes yeah, there's a of lot the... of tricks yeah there's a lot of tricks for automotive photography and when yeah. you're in studio it's you know you pick up a lot and then trying to translate that to cgi it's a little it's a little different but mm -hmm. you know having that background and knowing it of right. course i did 15 years of cars so i'm like car burned out like I oh i'm sure touch another car in my life but unless yeah. it's the right project but yeah I, well i i I, I, know I, what you're I do know i yes i i i did i didn't do 15 years of cars i did i did i did uh, I did some cars, but uh, not 15 years, but I can definitely sense that you get burned out. But what it does teach you, I think, is it teaches you a lot of discipline about certain things, oh, right? Right. So, so I think those time, that time was probably well spent to learning that, that discipline, right? Yeah. And especially, you know, back when we were doing 810 film outputs, you'd work on an image and you'd output to 10 and then your art directors would look at it with a 4X loop on an 810 film. Like, I mean, we're talking... 2000 dpi resolution like at what they're looking at so right. you know they're looking at threads and seams and so yeah it taught me sort of just that you know the perfection and and like like you said it was uh like the dedication to try to get that stuff the details right down it was brutal but it, it did teach me that <laughs> yeah so. yeah well so so during that time, I mean, obviously, I've seen I've seen your work, and it's it's really cool work. But uh, you definitely have a style. You, de I mean, you can see yeah. all those images have a style and have a look to them that are very kind of like you know it seems unique to you in a lot of ways. And so that took some time, I'm sure, to sort of develop and hone that style on your own. So how did, how what was it that it sort of inspired that? What are some of the things that sort of got you there? Yeah, I think you know it's it's funny because I. I didn't set out to set a style or develop one through my work. I think it just organically developed. Um, you know, I just kind of, when I was starting out in my retouching years and then I was going more into art, and digital art, I would always start to critique work and say, okay, well, why do I like something? What is that I'm drawn to? And then why don't I like something? I mean, just yeah. as important, you yeah. know, like, oh, I don't like that. Well, why don't I like that? Mm -hmm. What you know, what about it that I wouldn't do or how I would do it differently? Right. So I think just years of doing that and sort of, you know, it's the practice, practice, practice. I got to the point where I just um, just do the work how I see it and yep. not worry about trying to emulate somebody else or do a certain style. I just kind of you know, create the image how I envision it. And then I think that's why all my work is uniquely me because mm -hmm. I'm not trying to pull other people's techniques or styles into my work. Mm -hmm. I might use it as inspiration, but I would say, go back again. Well, how would I do it? Or how would I do it differently? Right. Um, so I think, you know, it's funny you say that because there's that hashtag same artist that's going around on Twitter. And um, it just shows like you put up four or five images and okay. They're supposed to look different. Like, oh, this is all from the same artist. Well, I put mine up and I'm like, yeah, I have a bunch of different projects, but I still think everyone could say, yeah, Mike worked on all of those, even though right. they were uniquely different projects. Yes. So I think it's just, you know, it's interesting. I didn't, I didn't set out to get that style. I think it's just, like I said, it was just organically happened. And now it's more of just who I am as an artist and where I'm at in my career, where I just sort of put my vision on things and not worry about creating that style or that look. Yeah, I, I agree. I think obviously, you know, I see, I see what you, you know, you're doing, you have very, you know, strong, uh, background colors, like your background colors are make everything pop in terms of the content that you're doing. Uh, so, so that seems to be, you know, something that's very, very, uh, strong in your, in your, in your expression, as well as the action and the narrative and the framing and, and, uh, the, mm -hmm. the sharpness There's very, your stuff is very sharp, <laughs> it's, which yeah. is, yeah. <laughs> which is kind of cool too you know yeah There's, we're not looking at soft focused or anything of that nature yeah I, is I turn crispy. off the boku yeah yeah, like I, <laughs> yeah that depth of field is not yeah I, I try you know that's on that's on purpose too you know like right that's, um to help tell the stories that i tell and yeah. I think a lot of it, it's funny you said that you know there's a lot of like movement and story and details and i think that's for me coming from a still background i just mm -hmm. could never get into the motion and the it just wasn't my, like, I couldn't work on frame by frame of something for that long of a period. My attention span just won't let me mm -hmm. do that. But I try to capture that feeling. Like, how can I tell that story or that motion in a single frame and using yeah. details to do that? So I think that's what, you know, I always 
you know, I'm just like everyone else. I'm on social media and watch all the video effects guys and all the motion stuff. I'm like, oh, that's really cool. But, you know, it's not me. It's not sort of what I'm about. I'm about, but I also try to get that same essence in a still image, you know, right. compared to something moving. Yeah, but let's talk a little bit about that. I mean, if people are out there, like you said, people are out there they're on social media, they're looking, they're looking at, it, at at things that other people have done, and then all they learn to do is to do things the way that person has done things, right? They don't necessarily right. find the time to learn their own voice and their own style. Uh, do you think, I mean, I don't think people have that much patience to sort of wait and slowly develop their own style. What I mean, what do you think people need to do in order to to overcome that and sort of make things to, their own in some ways? Yeah, I mean, I I completely agree. I think we're a like need to be fed society, just instantly stimulated, constantly needing stuff. And you know, the big thing is, I get. I mean, I get the question all the time: is I'll put an image out, and they're like, "Oh, do you have a tutorial on that? Or can you tell me how to do that? Or what software do you use?" And, <sighs> You know, I said, you know, whatever happened to the day of just like looking at it and maybe trying to figure it out yourself for a little bit, you know, like not right. being told what to do or told how to do it step by step, because then you're just going through the process that I've gone through myself, you know, mentally that I developed as I was working on it, you know, and sometimes when I'm working on things, like things will pop up or come in my head and I'll change direction or I'm making all these creative decisions on the fly. Mm -hmm. and, people who are just doing the tutorial or following other people's styles or, you know, things, they're not making those creative decisions because they're already made for them. Right. So I think that's the, you know, that's the key is sort of the, the self-motivated projects that aren't a tutorial or aren't trying to mimic something or aren't trying to recreate what somebody else recreated because, um, you know, that's too easy to do creatively mm. to just, copy someone's already made the road the creative roadmap now you're just executing so yeah i hope you could execute it better because they did the creative thinking for you ahead right. of time now you're just executing better and not going through those steps so i i think you're right and in, in that ability to make those creative decisions quickly and on the fly come with practice and over time and people just want to be there right away and it, it just doesn't work that way i mean like i said i was in 15 years in a studio just grinding away, doing different things, trying different things, um, especially back, you know, before all the tutorials blow up and stuff, right. you know, you, you kind of had to figure it out on your own. And that's, you know, I'm kind of thankful. I, that's how I learned in my careers during that time, because it, I was able to explore and find techniques. And I think you were talking to Alan McKay the other time mm. about, yeah. you know, like the restrictions of software and hardware when stuff's hard and you have to really be, uh diligent on how you set things up and you know is it going to take 10 hours to render or is it this file going to take an hour or like what are little right. workarounds to just work better and faster in the creative process and i think that that slowing down pace when i first started was really helpful but again you need patience to yes to do that uh, so yeah. i yeah i completely agree i think that's it's almost a, it's just a uh a result of all the social media constant, you know, RD, all these sphere tutorials and spheres and explosions on white and black and Houdini effects just floating all over the place. You know, right. it just, it is, it's eye candy, you know, it's intriguing. And it's like, oh, I want to do that. But then, you know, in the end, what is that really getting you or where is that putting you as an artist? Right. Um, yeah. I think it's interesting because, you know, like you were, like you were just, you know, saying, you know, like there's a lot of tutorials out there and people can make those tutorials. And I've actually seen people, you know, this is back in when I was, you know, a VFX supervisor and people hand in their reels and it's like, they would literally have a reel of tutorials that they've done. <laughs> yeah. Like, <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Where's the artistry? <laughs> you, that just shows that you know how to push the buttons and right. that's not anything, right? So uh, I think those are, those are challenges. You sort of have to find a way to express yourself in some ways. However, I am going to slightly contradict myself here because I okay. do think it's important that, uh, uh, well, not important. A lot of great artists come from inspiration of other artists, of course, right? Mm -hmm. And so you mentioned, you know, you look online and you look at a lot of things. So you still 
find it important to go online and to check what other people are doing right. and see other things. Oh, I think you should constantly consume. Like, I think you should be visually consuming all the time. Right. I just don't think you need to be regurgitating like, right. all the time. So, right. um, you know, I'm consuming all the time. Like I'm just, you know, when I take breaks, I scroll through, I just, and I'm looking at things that like instantly grab me say, okay, okay. well, why did I just stop and look at that? What, what about the lighting? What about the composition? Is it the subject matter? You right. know, all those things sort of go into an image or, you know, an animation or lighting uh, to tell a story. So, you know, I, I'm always consuming because yes, you need a visual mental catalog of things in your brain and as an artist to say, oh, you know, like I remember, you know, there was something about this image that really struck me. Like, how can I apply that mm -hmm. to my work? Or if I'm on a project, how will it apply to this project? Or is it even necessary to apply to this project? You know, it might not sure. be something that fits the story or the brand that you're trying to sell at the time. Um, but those are all things that I think you need to constantly be consuming and studying uh, art, which is different than just doing tutorials. Like I think it's, they're two different things. You know, the tutorial is getting educated in software and process so that you're not getting your creativity is not getting hung up because you don't have the ability to do it. Right. You know, it could so give like, you ideas of like, oh, I could, if I did this and I could do that, you know, and right. so I just need how to learn how to do this so that I can do that. <laughs> right. right. Exactly. Or yeah. if I'm working and I think of a concept and I'm like, oh, well, I, I don't know how to get that achieved, then I'll go look and say, oh, is this something, you know, that I can do in a shader or is this sure. a simulation or, you know, and it, and figure it out that way. Um, mm -hmm. But I just don't scroll through my tutorial sheet and say, well, today I'm going to do this tutorial <laughs> and post it on my feed, you know, it's, <laughs> right. um, yeah. you know, yeah, and I think, uh, it, and it's also like where you're at in your career too, you know, that has a lot to do with it. You know, when you're starting out, you kind of, you're just kind of like wading through the muck and not really sure where you're going. So that's just stuff that you do. Um, I mean, we all did it. You know, right. we all started out doing tutorials, but at some point you have to get past the, uh, just learning the software and then sort of, well, what's like, what am well, I doing you, as an artist? When you started, I mean, you were talking about the early days of Photoshop. I know exactly what you were talking about in 92 or 93 is probably when you were talking about, right? So, right. For, yeah, I think it was, yeah, it was 90, 90, 91 is when it was Barney scan. And then right. Photoshop one was 92. Yeah. 93. Yeah. yeah. So, so though those days, I mean, it was like, uh, there were no tutorials, right? So you had no. to, you had to sit down and, and Photoshop was a lot simpler. It didn't do very much. No, <laughs> so, no, no layers, no undos, like right. one undo, I should say you got yeah. one. Yeah. <laughs> you got one to go back, but yeah. Yeah. So it was, it was interesting. Uh, so, so, so the, the, the thing is that you slowly learn the software as the software got, got bigger. It's not like you're here you go, you know, you're sitting someone into the cockpit of an F 15 and say, fly it, right. <laughs> you know? Right. Well, uh, I mean, it's, it is, but then it isn't because there's a lot of software packages I haven't even dove into. Mm -hmm. And in my mind, I'm like, oh, I should really just like get in there and learn that. But then like, it just, it doesn't quite apply to what I'm doing or it doesn't have the look that i'm trying to achieve sure. so it's always on the back burner so if the time comes up where i need to learn it then i will so uh, yeah i mean there's tons of packages and you know i'm actually i'm cg wise i'm probably like the most limited knowledge guy you have on your podcast because <laughs> you know my background's more in you know photoshop photography like that right. stuff i can do in my sleep cgi right. was more of a catch-up and then now i've kind of found my process and my workflow and I keep wanting to like venture out, but you know, life right. and work and every sure. time I think, Oh, I'm going to take some time and learn some new software. Then, you know, project pops up and I can't do it. So, well, let's talk about how you got to there because I'm sure there's a lot of people who, you know, maybe have a job and they're maybe doing some illustration or maybe doing this and that, but what allowed you or what motivated you, what, what motivated you and what allowed you to sort of make the jump and start your own company and do that? How, how did you okay. get to that point? Yeah, no, that's, that's a really good question because it was something I struggled with while I was working at a studio for, you know, a few years before I left and mm -hmm. I just came to the realization that there were certain things made me happy as far as like my work life, like doing things and a bunch of things 
I wasn't happy doing, but I did it because I could do them sort of well, or they paid bills, whatever. Sure. And at one point I was like, all right, why don't I just focus on the stuff that I love to do? And then that was the imaging and CGI. So while I was working, I said, okay, well, this is my plan. I'm just going to do this stuff on my own at night, like learn, try to just get better at it. Yep. And then when I felt that my skills were at a certain level that I could start branding myself as an artist. Okay. I thought, all right, well, I'm going to start putting stuff out there with my name attached to it. Everything previous to that was attached to the studios that I worked for. You know, we'd put sure. work out and it was the studio's work, even though I was the one who worked on it. So I made a conscious effort like, okay, I'm going to start producing my own work it has nothing to do with the studios I'm working with or their clients, just stuff that I like to do. And I started putting that out there. Um, and, and when was building. this about what time, what, what, what around eight years ago, 10 years Let's ago? See. Like, I'd say it probably started like, yeah, 2010. Okay. Um, maybe 2008. I don't, when I, Behance, I think Behance started 2007. So maybe 2008. Okay. Um, Cause I was like one of the first, few people on that platform because i thought it was pretty intriguing so i just started yeah. putting stuff on there uh that was kind of the first place i started to do it um and then as not flicker like a lot of people were using no, flicker. no. <laughs> like photo bucket or whatever those <laughs> yeah whatever those were um right. yeah because it was more that was geared more toward the creative industry yep. um and it and what i liked about it it was curated so that you know right. the, the stuff that was good rose to the top and got mm -hmm. noticed so it was a nice motivation to create something that would that was unique and everybody liked and would go viral right. and then get pushed to the top. Uh, so that's when I started sort of branding everything with my name on it. And mm. then I started getting a couple things noticed. Then I started doing a few like PR things, you know, like Photoshop magazine and um, 3D World and, you know, a bunch of other different. And how did you how did you make that work? How like how did you get onto those things is, did people find you or did you kind of find a way to reach out to 3d world and i just guys? started posting stuff back then it was you'd post in their galleries and then somebody might contact you from the publisher because uh, you know like photoshop i think it was called photoshop not photoshop world uh, advanced photoshop that's what it was okay uh yeah would contact me and then like cal b1 like they did the photoshop guru award i won that one year and then nice. that kind of got a little name recognition and then I just started doing more and more of those, um, okay. you know, PR things. So I was doing like web stuff, PR stuff, and it got to the point where I started getting enough brand recognition with my work to where I was starting to get client requests or getting requests for them from photographers to say, Hey, do you want to work together or collaborate? Right. And then that way we would work on projects and then we would both promote it. So then you're getting like the double exposure, you know, you're both putting the footwork you're working with each other. Yeah. You're working yeah. with each other. So you're, you're both benefiting because you have twice the, the net you're throwing out for the fish. Mm -hmm. um, so then that just started building. And then it got to the point where I was basically running two full-time jobs. You know, I would run a studio, come home right. and then working for clients, freelancing, trying yeah. to start that business up and to the point to where it was like, becoming unhealthy you know like right it's like i gotta not do this anymore right and then made a decision and it was scary like it was the, probably the scariest thing in my career that i've done just to put my two weeks in and say that's it i'm in control of my own destiny but okay you know i look back at it and like so thankful that i did it because it's really given me the opportunity to focus on my craft and do the projects i want to do and um to, to build up my client base and being working from home now and seeing more of my kids and no commute. It's been fantastic. So, yeah. Yeah. Well, that that's actually, well, there, there are, you know, we are now at the, the age where there, there are people of our age and generation, right? You know, I'm, yeah. you know, I'm close, I'm getting up there close to 50 at this point. And, and I'm looking at it. I'm like, okay, well, how, can I make a jump or could I do something like that? Because maybe I want to do something that I've, I've been, you know, I'm not me particularly, but someone mm -hmm. like me could be, uh, you know, saying, okay, I've worked in a visual effects studio forever. I want to do something different. I want to become this, or I want to do that. And it's a really risky thing to feel like it's really scary. And yeah. you have a family, you have to support that family. Right. And you're doing right. a lot of things to, to work on that. And, 
Um, what gave you the confidence, or maybe you just say, I'm just going to take a chance, but what gave you the confidence that you said, okay, I feel that I have enough client base now that I can do this? Okay. Yeah. I mean, I think <laughs> it was a confidence, you know, there's a financial confidence and then there's a confidence in my work. Yes. And I think, you know, financial confidence, I talked to a couple other artists, some photographers, and they said, you know what? Like, save, save, save. And if you can save up enough to have a year's salary, save, okay. it'll take all the pressure off of you for that first year to where you start getting anxiety and you're not getting work. And you know, right. like it just that all kicks in. And then they're like, you can't be creative. You can't be free. You can't be willing to do things to start the business. If you're just constantly worried about like, there's no money coming in or paychecks <laughs> or, right. you know, yeah, yeah. Um, so that was the financial side of it. So that's why it took some time because I just said, all right, I'm going to, you know, this is save, save, save. Yep. And then the other side of it was, is okay. Is my work good enough and going to get recognized to get jobs? Yeah. Um, and that's where I started slowly doing the freelance and slowly doing the branding mm -hmm. uh, of my name. And then once I started getting, you know, frequent requests, I was like, okay, well there's, you know, there's words getting out. I'm starting to get some contacts. I'm working right. with people. And then I think that was sort of the shift. I'm like, okay, so the financial, and I know I can at least have a few jobs going into, right. you know, something to start with. Um, and then, then that's just made the jump, but going into that, I knew, okay, so once I'm into this on my own, I need to make sure I carve out time every year to do personal projects because interesting yeah personal projects are what got me the work i wanted to do right nice so i make it a point that every year i carve out time to not take on paying projects to do my own thing or to collaborate with other artists or photographers and say hey we're going to work on this project together and we're going to promote it you know, what type of work are we looking to do? Are we making a, you know, political statement? Are we targeting athletes? Are we going after a certain brand? Are we doing product shots? Or, you know, what, you know, what's the end goal? And mm -hmm. is that something I want to work on in the end? So, you know, there's the, the financial side, the getting commissions, but then also the ability to just do work that you personally enjoy and do. And obviously, if you're doing that, you're going to, do well at it. You know, it's like, if you do what you love, you don't work a day in your life saying, um, you know, so if you're putting the work out there that you like and it's good, it's going to get recognized. I mean, it, right. especially this day and age, if it's anything that's good and people notice it, it quickly gets like recognized and sent around the social media networks and, right. um, you know, it goes viral pretty quickly. Yeah. Um, I mean, I saw one of your projects on specifically actually about social media, right? The neon signs yeah, that you did. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Which is, yeah. Which is funny because that, that came about not in a tutorial, but me looking for a project and how to do like wet pavement parking lots, CGI. Right. And then using like the environment fog. And I was just doing some tests and then put it aside. And I've always had this, um, concept about something about facebook and we used to call it facade book you know like it's a joke because that's right. really what it is right and so it was kind of like the me working and researching a technique and me having this written down in my notebook of ideas and those two kind of just combined one day i'm like oh my gosh why don't i just make these things signs in this like dystopian empty space with these parking lots right i'm like it's it's perfect because it's exactly what <laughs> social media is you know it's right. like this empty space but with this glowing candy like sign it's like come look at me <laughs> but no one's you know like there's really yeah. no one around to right look at. so yeah yeah, yeah. Uh, you know that's like that so yeah projects like that exactly it's where i'm trying to learn a technique but i'm also um trying to express myself as an artist and those two just happen to combine on that one well you know that's not too dissimilar from pixar right like pixar does their do their shorts and their shorts are always like a way for them to try out a new technique, but it also mm -hmm. is an opportunity to do a really cool statement of some kind. Right. So, right. Uh, right. I think that sounds interesting to, to, to yeah. always try to find that, that personal growth moment, be it professionally or emotionally, or just trying out right. new techniques. Right. Yeah. Plus it's a nice outlet as an artist to just work on something that 
you want to work on or you enjoy or you're trying to make a statement right. um, as opposed to constantly doing projects for other people or being told like no oh, i don't like this let's change this like you're right. the one in charge it's kind of you know it's freeing and it's nice and especially when you put it out there and you get a reaction and people react um you know it's yeah. kind of a nice feeling like hey this is what i was trying to portray this is what i got out there and people got it or it clicked with people and, right you know, it's uh, you know, it's a nice feeling as an artist to do that. Do you feel, I mean, cause I'm sure now, you know, obviously you've, you've gone into you know, doing your own, your, your own stuff, you've gone on your own and you've gotten a bunch of work. Um, do you feel that doing the personal projects also helps you get new customers and get new ideas across or? Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I mean, I, half the projects I do personally are to target paying clients for commission you know ah, to right. try to do something that i think people would buy and then the other half are just personal like i want to do this for fun right see so it's it almost works. a marketing for yourself <laughs> oh, it's, <laughs> it's completely like that's the only marketing i do for myself are interesting these personal projects that are targeted mm -hmm. um, toward clients or the type of work that i want to do so yeah. you know it's funny because i did a test i was just running some deformers and test and did those beats by dre uh, sample i'm sure you saw with the like the twisting lines and the yeah. headphones and literally the day i clicked like post that i got a call from specialized that says hey we have this shoe that we want this airflow to go through like you know wh what do you think and i'm like oh i just put this project online what do you think of using this technique yeah. for your shoe and they were like oh my god that's perfect that's exactly what we're looking for exactly yeah boom and then you know boom so it just kind of led into that into that project so uh, you know that's why i always when i talk to younger digital artists or even kids in school like doing portfolio reviews i i like pound into them the importance of the personal project um mm -hmm you know, just for learning, but it also, you know, if they're going out to get a job or they're looking to get a job in the studio, it shows people how you think, like, you know, like you said, you get a reel and it's filled with tutorials, <laughs> you know, it's tutorials. Or if I see a portfolio and it looks like all class assignments, you know, clearly you can spot a class assignment from a mile yep. away. Yep. Um, you know, it doesn't show me how you think or what you think or how you see things as an artist. You're just, you know, doing the pushing, like you said, pushing the buttons and right. taking the direction. So, um, I think that's another reason why it's so important and it's helped me in my career because agencies and clients trust that, Hey, we can give him a concept and he knows how to work through it and right. come up with a creative solution. Like he doesn't need to be told every step of the way what, what he needs to do. Right. So yeah. that's an important thing. And I'm sure, I'm sure you, 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 you do that. But one of the things I remember, you know, like going back to the car commercials, we used to have some really cool, successful car commercials and people's like, that's really cool. Can you do a car commercial for us? that looks exactly like that one. <laughs> you know? Yeah. And that's a t tough, it's like, well, no, because, you know, Ford pay me for that. I can't do that for this guy, you know, whatever it is, you know, yeah. I can't, it's like, we have to come up with something you can, you can derive from it, but you got to do that. So how do you, con you know, because I'm sure people look at your work it's like, I like what you did, do the same exact thing for me. So how do you deal with customers who want that? Kind um, of stuff? Yeah. So I, I mean, I do, I get that like quite a bit and yeah. sometimes I'll, I'll say, okay, well, let's, let's start there and let's see how we can make this slightly different or if that concept or that technique is good to tell your story or if it fits your brand, then yeah, let's go ahead and do it, but let's still try to make it unique to you. Like, let's not just, you know, echo ourselves creatively. Sure. Um, so, you know, yeah, I get that request a lot and it's funny. I think it's pretty, I think it's across the industry, especially advertising marketing. I mean, I, I know some guys who own studios, and I'm like, man, like I can't tell the difference between your reel from this A shoe company and this B shoe company and this C right. shoe company. I'm like, they're yeah. all different, but the effect and stuff's the same. And they're like, I know we'd like try to tell them to do something different. And they're like, no, but I want that. Yeah. That you've done in the past. And it's like, you can't like get it. And you're like, okay, well, I guess I, you know, like you can only push so far, you know, if you want I know. work and clients, but you know, I try to tend to sway them. Like, I won't say no up front, but I'll just maybe get them in and say, okay, well, let's just try something a little different or do it in a different way. 
It's very challenging it's, I mean, because I, you know that when they saw your work, they probably didn't have any idea what to do when they saw your work. It's like, great, let's do that. And we'll just yeah. call that person and have him do the exact same thing. <laughs> right. Yeah. You know? Yeah. And, and I'd say the, the, that life proof project where I worked with Tim Tatter and the models are standing cool, in the CGI. Yeah. yeah. I probably get that request like once a month from somebody really to, like, do that. Yeah. And I'm like, I just, I, I'm like, it, it, one, it doesn't work for your brand. It doesn't make sense. Right. And two, like I, you know, I've done it so many times, like let's move on to like something new, you know? Right. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's so great. It's so great. And it, I was, just, I was like going to bring up that project because it really sort of like, there's so much about that project that feels very much about, you know, a, a good sample of the kind of work that you do. Right. It's, it's very sharp. It's very crisp. You've got a very, you know, cool, uh, chromatic background, right? Mm -hmm. You've got uh, tons of stories inside each picture. <laughs> right? yeah. There's yeah. lots of stuff going on. And it was also, because I saw the making of video as well, there was also a lot of work that the photographer did the same thing. Like, okay, I want to rock oh, yeah. here. I want this. Oh, yeah. So you guys all work together to create this great image and, and make it all happen. And so that was a really cool project because it, it does tell a lot of stories. And I can imagine people like, oh, well, he's found a way to tell a ton of stories in the still and let's just do the exact same thing. I can imagine yeah. that was requests. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All that time. Yeah. It, it, it does. Yeah. And, and that just kind of goes into, it's funny. You mentioned photographer, Tim, like, yeah. you know, that that's the great part about collaboration too. And I love doing those types of projects because him and I would pre pro even before he shot and like, okay, what well, can we do CGI? What can we do in post? Yep. What can, what do you have to shoot practically? Yeah. Um, and we did a lot of back and forth in a short amount of time because this was like a time crunch thing. So we were on meetings and with the art director. And um, yeah. yeah, so we were like, we had to cover all those details because we had no time. And like you said, there was, there's a million things going on inside this <laughs> tiny little image. Right. Um, so yeah, you know, but that's what I love about collaboration, especially when you get, when you connect with other artists who are kind of like, and the same thinking, same work ethic, you know, same level as you you can really elevate each other, um, mm -hmm. you know, like your work, or he'll think of something that I didn't think of, think of, or I'll send him something after he shot. And he's like, Whoa, like I didn't even, that wasn't even on the radar. Right. Um, and it's kind of exciting as artists to go back and forth and to feed off each other. And then, you know, the end results like a great series of images. Right. So yeah. obviously you do collaborate with some great photographers. I'm sure there's plenty that you guys work back and forth on together. Right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, yeah, that's that's probably my favorite. I mean, because I can shoot and do the CGI myself. Um, yeah, you know, like most stuff. But for me, I just love like bringing in another photographer, a high level guy who's been doing it for years too, to just sort of so that we can surprise each other. I mean, I mm -hmm. guess there's no other way to say it. You know, like I'll give my ideas and my thoughts, and I have a vision going into the shoot, and I'm like, okay, but you know, like just do your thing, like when you're on set and you see the angles, like, you know, it's better than me. I don't want to force you into a box right. and say like, no, we got to do it from this angle. Cause my CGI scene will look this way. Sure. Um, and then I'll get the, you know, I'll get all the film back for, or not film, but the shots back from him. Right. And I'll just, some of them, I'll just be like, Whoa, that's like, I didn't even think of that as an option or a possibility. Right. And then I'll take that and I'll feed off it and then do the same thing. I'll start doing my CGI exploration, compositing, and then send it back. And then they're just like, whoa, you know, like we try to give each other those wow moments. And that's, um, you know, there's something about that that I like more than just, you know, working on a project myself. Right. Yeah. Well, you, you mentioned earlier, it's like, you know, your first foray into, into, into CG was, uh, on a Mac. I remember it was Strata Studio Pro and yeah. Form Z. And I think there was Infinity was another one that yeah. was around. Yeah. yeah. And then <laughs> there was all the little like niche ones, like Bryce and Poser. And oh yeah. Yeah. All yeah. Those. yeah. 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 Yep. Absolutely. Yeah. I actually, one of the first things that my wife did when she got into CG was to do a big Bryce animation for a planetarium, believe it or not. Okay. Well, it's funny because I, that's back in the 90s, I, I had Poser and used to do that. And I actually did the cover art for two or three of the boxes for that. Oh, for Poser? For Poser, yeah. Wow. Um, <laughs> yeah. So that was kind of like my, I don't know, that was just almost like a hobby. Like I would just right. do it to take a break from cars. You know, I'd be like, I'd rather work on some people. People, yes. <laughs> yeah. Like, 
<laughs> you know, just totally like the get opposite it. shift. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so yeah, that's funny. And then I just kind of dropped away for a few years doing CGI and then jump back in. Um, right. Well, let's talk about that, uh, that, that CG stuff. I mean, like how, you know, you obviously you're playing around with it on a Mac, you're doing some stuff with the poser, uh, stuff, yeah. but how did, what, what sort of really got you more into it? What, how did, how did that sort of happen? Um, so when we were in the automotive industry, we were trying to figure out a way to like real time render cars. <laughs> So to make still decisions. trying to figure that out. <laughs> yeah, to make decisions. I mean, this was like 99, 2000. Yeah. Um, so we were using some different softwares. And I was like, well, you know, I, I just really, you know, the whole like render and pray change, render and pray change days right. where you had to just constantly keep doing renders. Right. Well, that's when I came across Moto and it had the first like interactive preview window. Right. And I was like, wow, that's pretty amazing that I can just like sort of see what I'm working on lighting and get pretty quick previews. Yeah. And, and then this was not like, F prime though, right? This was before F prime. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Yeah. So I was like, wow, this has some possibilities. So I'm okay. I just for create, and it was more for creative reasons than it was uh -huh. like, Oh, I'm going to get into the technical CGI. Cause that's where it's headed. I was just right. like, Oh, like I, I like what I can do in CGI, but I just don't like the process at the time. Like, the, you know, it's all numbers and moving lights and settings and materials. And then you click and you hope you did it right. And you're like, Oh, that's not even close to what I was thinking. Yeah. So that that's what shifted me from kind of just playing it as a hobby to like, wow, this can really affect my work or like help me explore new things that I couldn't have explored or I could have, but it would just taken me 10 times as long right. to do. So that's what kind of got me into it. Um, was that, yeah, it was just that, like that previewing and being able to sort of get feedback and see things as I was working on them and make creative decisions without waiting for stuff. Um, okay. And then that's just, I just kind of progressed from there. And, and Moto seemed to be like something that you gravitated towards, right? At that point. Yeah. And it's do. because it was, you know, I, we were, like I said, we were doing some alias stuff like Autodesk had like a program called showcase, which had real time, like CAD visualization. Okay. Um, yeah. we had some Maya it, and I like knew my way around it and, but I just didn't feel, I never felt comfortable in it. And for some reason, Moto was more like a Photoshop based feel to it and the layers okay. and i was like oh it's just it's intuitive to me like i wasn't right. a node-based person i was a layer-based person got it so it just felt natural to me and i picked it up super quick i mean like from never opening it to you know within a month like creating projects in it like right fairly easy um so that's why i just gravitated to it it just you know the ui and, it, and at that time i don't even think like cinema 4d even really even was out yet or if it was it was in its infancy um because mm. that's when you know it was like light wave slash moto yep so like when that whole thing happened that's kind yeah. of when i jumped in huh yeah. yeah well that's cool i mean moto is i know i know there's there there's a there's a lot of hardcore moto people out there and they really love yeah. it obviously you know modeling tools and moto are yeah i was gonna very, say the modeling good. yeah like my <laughs> modelers like the guys i use just love moto i mean they can fly yep. in and there's just tons of um, just intuitive tools and how it works. Um, yep. yeah, guys just love how the, just how easy it is to, and it, and it plays well with everybody. Like you can sure. and import export just about anything in it. So, yeah. And, to, and just exactly like you said, I know still a lot, a lot of people who are, you know, who are doing basically, uh, you know, some of the old light wave guys who are, you know, sort of left light wave, but they yeah. stick with moto for the modeling and then bring it into whatever 3d yeah. <laughs> they do for yeah. other stuff. But you yeah. were, I mean, I remember one of the things, you know, you were one of the, when we made V ray for moto, you were one of the first really big hardcore adapt adopters of that program yeah. and and get that, made that work i mean what was what was that like i mean how how did why what got you motivated to try to use v-ray in that in that um area? i just i just love the 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 look of the gi and just the feel of the renderer um, yeah you know it's like every render has its own kind of look to it of course um it, and for me it was just that it was just that extra little level of realism that i could play with and had control of that the moto native render at the time didn't 
Right. Uh, so that's what kind of made me jump into it. And then as I got deeper into it, um, I mean, just the more I, you know, like the, the flexibility and the ability of the ray tracer and the GI and, right. um, and then moving on to moto next and the hybrid rendering and all that yep. stuff. So, um, so it's been keeping up. So it's not one that I've had to abandon because it's been keeping up with technology and, right. and it, and it sort of fits my style. Um, you know, and it's funny, I just saw a post on Instagram from Ash Thorpe, who's yeah. like, a, he, he just posted a render a few days ago that was like, oh, I'm just getting into Studio Max with V-Ray, never used it before, but I think I'm using it from now on. He's like, I just love the GI in it. It just has the right feel. And I was like, I was like, whew, like somebody else, like I'm glad <laughs> someone else gets it. Thanks, Ash. Yeah. yeah. You know, it was, it was it was nice to hear because it was almost the validation you know like because i've gotten questions like oh well why do you use it and i'm like I, it just it fits my workflow and and i just right. like the look of it you know well listen i'm not necessarily uh, listen I, I work for chaos group but i also know that everyone has their own style and their own look and there's certain things yeah. that you're gonna gonna do and you know um uh, there's a some great artists out there I know who use Arnold exclusively, and there's like that's a look they can get with Arnold, right? And that's yeah. like a, you know, so I'm not necessarily going to argue uh, that at, at any point, but I just, just think right. it's interesting that like you you hit you you've got a really cool niche in terms of the work and the quality of the stuff you do. Like I said, you have a style that's your own, yeah. <laughs> and and then that shows, and there's like now that's a kind of interesting thing because it's a combination of Moto and a combination of V-Ray, and I think. Not to say that people need to pick those up, but I'm saying that tool set fits your your word, right. way of working. That seems to be pretty cool, and, and that's uh, by design too. Because yes, you know it's it's what I'm looking to achieve in my images. Because you know I've dabbled in other renderers and other things, sure. or I can see what everyone else is doing, and I'm like that's that's not me. I mean, it's cool, looks great, but yep. that's not that's not my work. So, right. um, you know, and cause I get clients when they want to try to have me collaborate or other studios and they're like, Oh, I want to do handoffs and stuff. And they're like, well, what do you work in? And I'm like, well, this is what I work in. If you want the image to look like my work, like this is, this is my process and this right. is what I use. So, you know, if you want me to hand it off to someone that's, you know, they're going to have to recreate it on their own <laughs> because yep. I'm not, you know, it doesn't work, you know, I don't work that way. So has anyone actually tried to take, I mean, obviously I'm sure that a lot of people approaching you because they love your style or love what you do. Has anyone ever tried to approach you and say, we like to do what you're doing, but we want an animated version of it or we want an animation of it. Uh, yeah. All, all the time. <laughs> uh, I can imagine. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, almost on every project and you know, which gets me into the, like, oh, like I need to learn, video effects animation but my brain just doesn't work that way so sure i will reach out to um some studios i mean i know guys who are like in video production and video effects and sure um can do it and and you know if i do the still it basically that's the style frame that the client will take and we'll have the animation handle it from there oh so um, you become like a concept artist at that point. <laughs> yeah so at that point i do the finish still and right and I can hand off assets, um, sure. you know, models and stuff so that at least that's the same. I mean, they're not going to get my full scene file cause it's not compatible with their pipeline anyway. Right. Um, and they'll just use that as like, okay, well, here's the starting frame. Let's match it, but in motion. Um, so yeah. that, that, that does happen and it's happening more and more. Um, you know, oh, really? so I'm, yeah. Yeah. And I, and like I said, I'm not going to do it myself. I don't plan on, it's not a thing I, I want to do. Um, but I will work with like studios and, and do a handoff and um, that seems to work pretty well too. So do, I mean, you picked up some of the, what, what came first photography or, or, or CGI to you? Um, Photoshop CGI came first. Okay. And then while I was working in the studio, I was just around photography all day long. Right. And just kind of picked it up and then started getting some equipment and, you know, practicing on my own shooting at home i have my own home studio you know lights and everything and yep um and actually i dove deeper into photography to help my cgi that's what i was about to ask it's like uh, how did you use one to learn from the other like what was right. the connection there? so yeah so i said okay i'm gonna get in the studio and start shooting practically using mm -hmm. my lights and modifiers and then i would get in the cgi and i said okay well what's the equivalent 
of this modifier I'm using compared to when I'm using CGI? Right. What's the limitations of one? What's the advantage of one? Mm-hmm. And how can I match them up to, to look similar? Like they're in one shot. Um, yeah. And, and that's what sort of taught me the, uh, the compositing and blending the two things is making sure that I'm consistent with those lightings between the two. And then if I'm working with a photographer, I can portray that or say, Hey, what, you know, what was your light set up? And I can mimic that, you know, oh, right. in CGI. You develop your language that way. It's right. So I yeah. can, I can say, Oh, what did you use? You know, is it, was it strobe? Was it a square, you know, soft box? Was it a beauty dish? You know, whatever. Right. And then I right. can translate that to what I'm doing CGI. Right. Yeah. Well, that's pretty cool. Do you get actually when you when a photographer do you try to have them do a reference frame of the of the lighting for you so that you can see what they lit it with or how it was positioned? Um, no, I mean I I can generally look at a photo and tell which modifiers and stuff are being used sure. on it now. Like I've gotten to the point where I can say, oh, they used you know a, a soft fill and a or a negative fill and a BD yeah. dish or a soft box or whatever. But I will still you know ask them you know, maybe some camera settings if it's, if I don't get the data from the actual shot. Right. Uh, you know, like you might get the metadata, data, right? Yeah. Yeah. Like, it, you know, you'll get the EXIF, EXIF file. Right. Um, so at least I can, you know, but even camera backs, you know, because they'll be shooting on one camera back and then the client wants this huge square piece of art. So then the right. camera backs don't match. So it gives you a general idea of setup, gotcha. but then I'll just ask them, you know, generally like, what they use or if i know the photographer really well like tim like i i kind of just know how he shoots anyway um right. so it's like you know it just kind of goes unspoken i know i just look at his photos and i can tell you know sort of the setup yeah so that's that's cool yeah. that's really cool um so so you know you've done obviously a ton of really really co- cool work what, what was some of your you know you mentioned uh, the the life uh, sorry what's life um life proof yeah. Life proof, uh, yeah, which is a, yeah. a, a phone case, right? Case. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. They got bought by Otterbox, so it's they like got bought Otterbox. by Otterbox, right? Yeah, yeah. So they're all like it's all the same Otterbox now. Yeah, yeah. It's it's basically like a very recognized case for your yeah. phone to yeah. <laughs> to do yeah. crazy yeah, stuff. Yeah, you can throw it, and yeah, yeah, it doesn't do anything. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and those are great. I, I really love that concept and it was a great advertising campaign. It's super cool. And I, I, you know, there's certain things, there's certain advertising campaigns that I look at and I'm like, I love that because it tells a story. I And I talk about this all the time. There's one I remember I was sitting on a subway in New York and it was a, a Guinness commercial. <laughs> Okay. And it was just a, it was a half drunken Guinness and it had all the, the little rings of foam, you know, from the Guinness to oh. get on there. And it said, uh, every ring tells a story. And it was like, you know, kind of like a, like a tree rings, but it was about the, you know, yeah. going to the oh, bar. I was like, what a brilliant commercial. You know, it just says a billion things. And there's certain, like, I felt the same way when I saw that life box commercial, because I was like, there's a lot of stuff going on in here. Yeah. But what yeah. were some of the other cool projects that you, that you did? Man, I mean, there's there's so many different projects. I mean, I'd say like probably my favorites are personal projects. Yeah. Um, so the motion and air that was probably it's with the dancers and the swirls. That's yes. probably like the image that sort of or the series of images that sort of said, okay, I'm here. Like my career starting. Like that. Nice. That was kind of the turning point. So that always has kind of a soft spot in my heart as far as projects go. Right. Um, and then the other one was like you mentioned the um, social media one. Uh, right. That one I just love because it was one of those things that I just like, just let it spew out like what I was thinking. I was like, sure. all right, I'm just going to like say things how I think. And, it, and that, I mean, that blew up, like everyone connected with it and people who could read the fine print, like that's where all the kind of the inside jokes were, were on the bottom of the signs and, and people even picked up on like the Behance copy was Comic Sans, which is like, you know, the, the yep. designers like, no, no. So, you know, <laughs> all those things like people like just really enjoyed that series. So that mm-hmm. that's another series that I, that I enjoyed making, um, like commission work. Yeah. It's hard. Life proofs always up there for sure. Um, there's some that are just kind of obscure that like didn't get as much recognition, but I still love, there was like an eye fly one I did with Tim where the, it's the wind tunnel indoor flyers. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, I just, something about that. I always just loved, um, 
And then a couple collaborations I've done with him, like the future of sports way back in the day where we did that kind of Tron esque sports fields with the like mm-hmm. neon glowing, uh, at night shots. That's um, cool. Yeah. Yeah. That one was pretty cool. That was, and that was one of the first personal collaboration projects I'd worked on ever, you mm. know, with another artist, um, was that project. Um, and that was, that was probably about 10 years ago now, almost. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, that was around the time Tron came out. <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, I'd worked on Tron. I did a light bike sequence. So <laughs> oh, okay. Yeah, so, yeah. And, and it's funny because we we came up with the concept. And at first we were thinking, okay, let's make objects that illuminate mm-hmm. like on their own, but like sports related. We're like, okay, so it's like sports. And the whole time we're like, okay, we can't, this can't be Tron. Like it can't look like Tron, yeah. you know? Um, so we kept steering to that. And then of course, like, as soon as we put it out there, people were like, Oh yeah, look like Tron. We're like, no, that's not, what we were, <laughs> you weren't going for well, that. Well, right. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, but I do know that like self, self illuminated things are, are hard because they're self illuminated and therefore they get flat really quickly. So it's mm-hmm. hard to make something self illuminated and still have shape at the same time. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's a challenge. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah, that for sure. We came across that. Yeah, you have to play with like how like strong that lighting is, and like right. Yeah, make sure that put a reflection on top, and then is like then yeah, you're covering yeah. the stuff illumination, and it's like oh yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, yeah, it's it real tricky. tough. Yeah, real tough. Yeah. But uh, but yeah, your work is really cool, man. I really love I, lo- I love well, what uh, what you do, and I you know I think that it's really great to sort of hear that story because I think especially nowadays, you know, when people are. Um, uh, you know, working from home, <laughs> yeah. they need to think about like, I, I'd love them to, to, to listen to this podcast to say, you know what, I need to do a couple things on my own to really uh, separate myself from the crowd or separate myself. And and I think that's yeah, something absolutely. that I should be doing. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. I mean, like I said, I, I will pound in the personal project and not personal tutorial projects, but personal, like, this is how I see things. This is right. what I'm about. This is how I think. And, and then put it out there. Um, but you also did it when you, you, you did it as a marketing of yourself too. You think about it right, as that. Right. Yeah. yeah you've got to have some, I mean, you, there's got to be some target or some, you know, unless it's just for fine art, which is fine too. I know a ton of guys are just doing sure. it for fine art and, and that's all they do it for. And um, who knows with all the crypto art stuff going on now, who knows? Right. Like, I, right. I don't know. That could be a thing. Right. But, uh, but yeah, I think it's really, uh, I think it's really cool that, uh, you're doing that. I mean, what are some, you know, obviously people are working from home for a while and that's nothing new to you. You've been working from yeah. home long before this been Yeah. yeah. <laughs> it's just yeah. business as usual. Now I just have kids home that aren't in school. That's the only problem. Yeah, I know that's been a little tough, uh, for us, but it's been, it's actually been good. Our kids are, you know, we all have our own little desks and our own computers. Yeah. So thank God I have a solid internet at home, so I'm okay there. But yeah, yeah. yeah <laughs> uh, for sure. but, uh, but what are some of the, you know, what are some of the advice that you can give people like working from home and like trying to keep focused on your, on your job and on, on keeping things working? Um, you know, for me, I, I just kind of, I'm a little more free flowing. I don't like to schedule my day and like, I got to fit everything into this. Um, I'll work like when I feel the motivation or I'm obviously if there's deadlines and stuff, but you know, if I'm just like find myself, I'm just like scrolling or I'm just consuming things and I'm not really being productive. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'll take a break and go away. Like I'll, you know, like now that the kids are home, like go do something with the kids or, you know, just go for a walk or, you know, during the summer, which is sad summer's over, but you know, we would just, yeah all of us would just take a break and go to the lake or go to the beach or, you know, do something, um, during the day. Cause I'm like, I can always come back at night and get stuff done. So I, I would always make sure I just take breaks just like mentally and creatively. Um, right. and then keep in mind like, well, there's no commute now. So you have that extra time. So like allow yourself to have that extra time. I mean, I, you know, early in my career, I used to work like, crazy hours like all nighters and stuff right. and you know like i said when i was trying to do both and i'm like it's just it's unhealthy like i just you just can't keep that up for a long period of time so i've learned to say no to a lot of things um yeah. to give myself breaks like not stress myself out because like it does it takes a toll on you like mentally physically 
Like if you're just trying to like burn it at both ends for, you know, it's that crunch time, like nobody likes it. Right. And I don't like it being promoted as a positive thing in the industry. You know, I think people need to have some balance. Um, Like you got to put the work in and work hard, but you also need to like take a break and let your body and mind sort of heal in between too. Right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I remember my friend Victor, uh, who's in San Paulo, Victor Hugo, he basically was telling some things like, it's great to be your own boss. It's like, it's terrible to be your own boss because like when you're not working, you can do whatever you want. Cause you know, it's like, I'm not working because I decided to take a break. And it's like, but now I'm not working and oh my God, all the work's piling. <laughs> you know? yeah. So you have to, you still have to kind of manage your t- off time and on time. Yeah. At some point. Yeah. yeah. I mean, even when I, we take vacations, you know, I still like make sure I set aside, you know, half hour hour in the morning on vacation to just go through emails correspondence like right whatever because i can't you know as you own your own business you can't ignore that right Uh, but like i said that's also where i can say no like i know in advance like i'm taking these two weeks off to go spend time with the family like right i'm not taking projects on like and i'll be up front with my clients and say no i'm i'm out but i'm back on this day if you want the timeline can wait otherwise like you know feel free to find another artist. Like I'm okay with that. Right. But you know, I don't try to hide it. I'm, I'm pretty upfront with clients about like, Hey, we're just like, I'm either booked or I'm taking time off. So sure. Sure. Yeah. Well, that's cool, man. That's really cool. Listen, I, I, this has been a great conversation. I've really been able to learn a lot from you and obviously your work is really cool. People should definitely check it out. Where, what is the best place for people to check out your work? Um, mikecompo.com and then my instagram is at mike compo and then obviously i'm behance on behance as well yeah that's where i feel like most people follow me is behance and then everything Uh else is kind of secondary but right um so behance is just slash mike compo as well right perfect cool well thank you so much mike i appreciate it all right thanks